plunge into the discussion tonight, I'm just curious by a show of hands, how many people in the audience have seen the production of The Blind? How many are, let's actually, hands again, sorry. One, two, three, fifteen, twenty or so? Am I getting that number right? How many intend to see a performance during the rest of the run? A slightly larger number, maybe, and so it's probably more like 15 in this group, is like 20. Well, that's interesting because I would say none of you have seen the blind. Because as most of you probably know, in order to experience this production, you need to be blindfolded before you see it. Now we have a, ah, see, I did it again, before you see it. It's very interesting how our language works with these things, and we had a talk slightly beforehand that I'm going to have us all do again on stage where we talked about, well, maybe you did see it if your mind created it, but I'll, I'll let the panel take that on. But before we begin, there are two quotes that I wanted to begin this discussion with. The first was from a really fabulous preview article about this production in the New York Times that ran this past Sunday by Vivian Schweitzer, and she was talking about this production, the opera by Lara Arbach, which is directed by Jean-Louis Chardier, which is, who is with us tonight on this panel. And he had this really, really interesting quote. He was quoted in the article as saying, that people are blindfolded as a logical step to get rid of the divide between the audience and story and characters. And Vivian Schweitzer's reaction to attending a rehearsal, because she saw this, she experienced this before the production began. She described being blindfolded as being initially disconcerting, but then vividly intense, as I became highly tuned to the sounds, sensations, and unseen movements unfolding around me. The other quote I wanted to begin with opening this was a quote from a music theater piece called the Immaculate Degeneration, a work by one of our panelists, an autobiographical one-person show that was presented in New York City last summer, written and performed by Pamela Sabah, who's on our panel today. And though she's not completely blind, she's been visually impaired since the age of 14, but she ends production saying, it's not either or, or neither nor. But the in-between can be seen as an invitation for what hasn't even been imagined yet. And I thought that was a beautiful launching off point for our dependencies on senses and how we experience the world through our senses. Our third panelist, Rebecca McGinnis, is a museum educator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and oversees, oversees, overhears, over smells, over touches, there's that word again, oversees, the various access and community programs that the museum does, which are a really fascinating array of programs for people, for everybody. And I would love to have her talk a bit about those programs. But I want to say that, leading into this, we live in a world that focuses so much on the visual. This is what I want to kind of have you all think in your minds as we talk tonight. It's often to the neglect of other senses, so that all the art we create, painting, novels, poetry, the dance, these are all visual things. Yet we have all of these other senses. We taste the world, we touch the world, we smell the world, we hear the world. And I think it's wonderful that the one very highly developed art form that's not initially for the eyes, music, is what brings us together tonight. This all happened because of this, this piece of music by Lara Auerbach that's been interpreted in this fascinating production. And there have certainly have been other art forms which use other senses over the years. There have been touch boxes by a Japanese fluxus artist named Ayo. There, there was an exhibition just a few blocks down the street, the Museum of Arts and Design of Perfumes as works of art. And so other senses have been engaged, but I think we neglect the other senses to our sensory deprivation, I would say. So I would love Rebecca to lead us off and tell us a bit about these programs. We all think of the Metropolitan Museum of Art as this place where you go to see things, but it's actually so much more than that. Thanks, Frank. Um, I guess I'll start with just describing how I got to um, be interested in, in multi-sensory experiences of art. Uh, I was born uh, what, what 
what's called legally blind, so not completely without sight, but partially sighted. Um, my functional vision is better than that now, so I like to call myself illegally blind because <laughs> I, I don't really know what else to say. Um, so I'm, I'm still partially sighted, but I was always interested in, in visual art, in drawing especially, making very detailed drawings, very, very close up. And uh, when I told my vision teachers I wanted to work in a museum and, and study art history, they said, aren't you afraid you're going to bump into things? That was the reaction that I got. And to me, it seemed a very natural thing to want to look at art and spend time looking at art because I have vision that changes all the time. So I'm a very, uh, I have to be an active looker and I have to be conscious of what I'm, what I'm looking at and try to interpret it. And that's what we do when we, when we look at, at visual art. And as a, an educator, I you know, encourage people to look at and think about what they're looking at and not just be passive and rely on their sort of lazy sense of vision, you know, in a way. You can, you can see something and decide you know what it is and then move on to the next thing. And uh, art is much more than that. Uh, so at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, the, the museum has a really long history, actually, of, of uh, making its collections accessible to people who are blind or partially sighted. Um, uh, in the first decade of the 20th century, there were uh, lectures for blind children. Um, Helen Keller visited the Met, and in the 1970s, a, a touch collection of works of art from the museum was established to begin to make the museum more accessible. And today we have a number of programs and our philosophy is really to uh, make everything inclusive, but also to uh, devise programs that are specifically divine, uh, designed with people who are blind or partially sighted in mind in order to offer variety and choice. So we have descriptive tours, what we call verbal imaging tours, and there's that sort of idea of mental imagery, which is multi-sensory, which we'll talk more about. Uh, so touch tours in the museum's galleries and also workshops using this handling collection of works of art that I, that I mentioned from the, the 70s. And we have a drawing class for people who are blind or partially sighted, really exploring a two-dimensional medium, um, which has been a very um, uh, innovative and interesting experiment for the two artists who teach that class. So there are really a variety of, of experiences, um, but increasingly we're offering multi-sensory programs for, for everyone because everyone can learn a lot from thinking about what, what they're experiencing through their other senses. As, as Frank said, smelling the world, um, listening to the world, and not just relying on your sense of sight, even when experiencing visual arts. So we have, for example, perfume workshops, and uh, music in the galleries, and uh, materials that you can handle to learn about uh, how an artist constructs a work of art and that kind of thing. So uh, I encourage you all to come and, and try some out, especially on a Friday evening. They're uh, often drop-in programs that are very multi-sensory in nature. Now, Pamela, I'm very interested in somebody who's visually impaired. You have had a career as an actress, singer-songwriter, and your life story has become part of the work that you create as an artist, which is, is really putting yourself on the line and, and, and very brave. And, and I imagine something that you, you've done to really let others know this can be done. And you've done work through, with Theater Breaking Through Barriers, which has had many milestones doing really fascinating productions involving people with many different kinds of impairments. Not, it began as a blind company, but it's evolved into something much more than that. I thought it would be very interesting for you to talk about your own experience, how you got involved with them, and, and the piece that you did last year that I quoted from. Just sort of give us an introduction to that. Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, in terms of getting involved in theater, um, I moved here from Detroit, and um, whatever that is that compels one to pursue art, I, I can't really, I don't know what it is except to say it felt right, and um, that it was one of the scariest things I felt I could do, and that was the very reason I thought I should do it. Because um, I realized as I was graduating high school and uh, wondering 
what there was for me uh, that to to really take risk um, is, is how I would find my way through the world. Because I wasn't going to just be able to move to the city. Um, the world is set up to be seen. I was diagnosed with macular degeneration when I was 14, so I wasn't able to read signs um, and follow those, those normal things that are set up that can kind of make it a little easier for us to get around. So I, I knew I had to like set out on this quest and follow uh, the sort of mystery and the question that, that theater posed to me. And anytime it scared me, that meant I should do it. Um, so that certainly was what, how I, I finally ended up writing my own piece to describe my vision, which is this strange, um, like the, the quote that Frank, uh, I was going to say cited, but uh, brought up, is um, <laughs> I'm in between um, sight and no sight. And um, that betweenness has fascinated me my entire life, even before the vision impairment. Um, I was always fascinated with the shades of gray, that things aren't so black and white, that I could never really fit into a certain label. Um, I always balked at being categorized. And uh, so anyway, um, somehow acting theater, that seemed to be the glue that held all my disparate uh, desires, passions, interests together. And so I got my MFA, um, theater and acting and um, made this slow migration from Detroit to New York City. And I auditioned for many theater companies and have worked with many different theater companies and worked in film and TV, but I um, found a, a home with Theater Breaking Through Barriers, which is formerly Theater by the Blind, which was an integrated theater company working with blind, vision impaired, and sighted actors seamlessly working together. Um, because for me, another thing about art that is so wonderful is it's about bringing people together as opposed to uh, the separation. And so I was never interested in pursuing just disabled um, roles or working with a disabled theater company, but, but about um, First of all, that would be a limited career choice. Uh, but also about where do we all connect up? And we all have a story to tell. And uh, it's about that aha moment of recognition. If we tell our stories, we just put ourselves out there. If I put myself out there playing any character, um, the sheer fact of doing it, telling that story, we're connecting somehow. And um, then of course by also by focusing on specific stories that are about disability, um, by by focusing in on that very specific experience like my, my own with uh, being partially sighted, hopefully that specificity will lead to a universality where we can say, hey, we're all in this in this together. So um, and honoring, like I said, honoring those those questions as opposed to what we, what I think I know. It was, it's a great way to go out there and, and keep questioning, keep putting myself on the line. So. One of the things that I find so fascinating is you know, you've, you've done sighted roles that are sighted roles, roles that are that are, are blind characters, but Brian Friel's play Molly Sweeney, which is is a blind character. You were the first visually impaired actress ever to do that role. Even roles that are blind roles are not traditionally done by visually impaired actors, which I find amazing, weird, and, you know. I know, and that's why when I set out to, to pursue acting, I didn't do it like with any political agenda, but, and I didn't seek out blind roles, per se. Um, but I could not help 
they sort of found me, and I couldn't help but to want to uh, lend my experience and my authenticity to, to these roles. And it's, uh, I become, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's like, yeah, <laughs> I really, I should be playing that. And um, it was great that the Amaryllis Theatre Company in Philadelphia had sought me out. I had auditioned for them prior to this um, production of Molly Sweeney that they did as their flagship production for a Disability in Arts Festival that was in 2009, 2007. It was the first one and it was Independence Starts Now. And so that was, it was very, very cool to have that opportunity to, to play Molly, who is blind from a very young age, um, but then she's given an operation to restore her sight because she's, in part, because they don't really see her for the rich world that she already inhabits. And um, they don't appreciate that. They, her husband, who pushes her into it, and the doctor who performs the surgery, have their own reasons for wanting this to happen. And she does it, has the operation, and is dealing with all this visual stimuli that's coming at her. And she has no frame of reference to, to take that and shape it. And um, like I say in, in my play, um, Immaculate Degeneration, we don't only see with our eyes. We, we construct what we see much more than, than we realize. In my case, it's much more extreme. I'm always having to compose the world around me. Um, my smells do it. I smell the Starbucks before I see the Starbucks. Um, I'm, my memory of where I've been will construct it for me. But anyway, Molly Sweeney didn't have that. So I also was, to, was able to lend my uh, experience as what it is to be partially sighted to, to this role as well. So yeah. it's, it's really great. John, as the one member of this panel who's not visually impaired, you've done this sort of extreme thing. You began as a chorister, and you got very interested in opera, and you brought this one sense that isn't about vision, and you added vision to it by becoming a director and adding the visual element to sonic scores, not just operas, but taking oratorios, which would normally not stage, but you added a visual element there and adding these other elements. To have that background as somebody who was a musician and then got involved with the visual thing, to do a production that's about taking people's sight away and being blindfolded and experiencing the world in every other sense, that's, that's, that's quite a leap, it seems. It may seem so. I have to confess, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem extraordinary to me in the least. Um, it's all for me about promoting and understanding. Um, and in fact, I think my last note to the cast before the first night was um, our job is to make sense of music. If we do that, then we've done our job. Um, and in that sense, blindfolding an audience was an attempt to help them understand music. Usually, whether I'm making a film or an opera production or a TV thing, um, I th I've found that using visual media has been a, a way of promoting understanding for sighted people of music because it helps them <coughs> construct or makes them understand the structure and rhythm. Just relationships. Music is geometric in many ways and if you, if you can see somebody play the rainbow, it's kind of fascinating. It's fascinating to listen to, but when you can see it as well, it's fascinating in a different way. Um, and so, approaching this piece, the characters can't see. So, if I want the audience to feel like the characters, it would be really weird to leave them as sight. It's just struck me as the most logical thing in the world. I should, I should just um, point out that, in a way, of course, Lera's piece is very much the same. Um, I did come to it because I was looking for a way of working in this genre to a degree. Like the last time I was at Lincoln Centre in 2007 was with another a cappella environmental immersive piece of 
music drama, if you like, and that had been a very successful project over the last long time, and it was coming to its end when we were here. So in the years that followed, I was looking for something else that would allow me to get singers close to an audience, a, a mix of them, even. Uh, and so I, I, no, I, I searched for a cappella opera on Google um, and found there are albums that lie because then at least, if not now, I probably still remember it. It was the only one. And then I ordered a score from the publisher and it took a while to make it happen. But So the, the leap towards blindfolding an audience was a consequence of deciding I was going to try and do this piece, having already established that I wanted to do it in an immersive way. So perhaps if I hadn't been wanting to do, if the immersive element hadn't been already part of my plan, possibly I would have left it on a stage, but I don't think so, because I, I, I'm so passionate about getting people to connect with art, that, that the division created by sitting in a theatre, looking at people who are playing people you can't see, I think would have bothered me anyway. This needs to be the questions that I'd love for us all to jump in on, whether it's theatre, or looking at a painting, or an opera, or reading a book. We're so overly, overly reliant on the visual world. Emily, you were saying you came to New York and you didn't see the signs. Now, do we, are we too reliant on our eyes to the point that we're not getting a full experience of the world and somehow getting a stunted view of what we can experience if we did experience things through all of those senses? Because of the I, I think absolutely. We, we rely so much on our, our eyes and our, eye, our, our vision, if we can see, is, is dominant. It's, um, it's, it's, it's there. It's, it's, you know, things are, are laid out in front of us and it's easy to ignore what our other senses are telling us. And by being blindfolded in this production of the blind, I felt that it, not, it wasn't so much that I'm relating to blind people, because you can't just be blindfolded and suddenly understand what it's like to be blind, but what was so effective was that I did, I did relate to the environment and, and everything that was happening. And there's so many references in the libretto to, um, to hearing, to feeling, to temperature, to, to sound, yeah, to smell. And I was very, very aware, as the characters were, of all of those other senses. And I think that's the, the key thing, that um, it really heightened my senses, because I wasn't, that there was, I wasn't having to look at anything. Mm -hmm. I was really thinking about what my body, my whole body was telling me. And also spatial relationships, where the, where the singers were in relation to me was so fascinating. I think the, the question of whether one is too reliant in, you, in normal life on, on visual stimuli, you know, it's difficult to answer. We've evolved into human beings that are dominantly um, dependent on, on vision. Um, a more interesting question possibly is that what do we cancel out by allowing ourselves to be dominant in that way? So that if you, I mean, I, I don't know the biology of it, but if you imagine that a portion of one's brain is more or less obsessed with what you see. Um, and then if you take that away, all that noise that you get from vision presumably creates a space where other things are allowed to echo or you know, to bounce around. Um, and I think that's kind of what it has to be as a relationship in response to the blind lobby. As you say, it's not possible to give somebody some sort of disability workshop. It's not, it's not meant to be one of those. It's to, since the subject is about not being able to see, and I would argue the metaphor is really nothing to do with biological blindness anyway, it's about not watching, not looking, um, in a much broader sense of the word. But in, in not allowing the audience to depend on the visual uh, stimuli, on visual stimuli, um, they, and because they're being led into a space, not knowing anything about it, not really knowing very much about the story, Deliberately, I created a scenario where the, where the audience knew about as much of the characters but no more, and therefore had to search for the rest of the story with the characters, and therefore went through the story as characters. Um, but in, in order to do that, um, everybody's so thirsty for information because they're not allowed to do the cheat, <laughs> which is to look. And actually, if you cheat, you ruin it anyway, so because it's nothing that interesting to look at. Um, <laughs> 
I shouldn't say that, of course, but... Um, and so one becomes incredibly dependent. The moment you think you smell something, oh, what's that? You hear something, what's that? And that but that's exactly what the characters in the story are doing, because they, they feel abandoned, they feel like they're unable to do anything, and they feel like they're, they're searching for some way of establishing their environment, where they are, what they can do, what they can't do, how threatened they are, how they can save themselves. And so the, the audience is doing the same thing, and because they can't see, they therefore become very aware and dependent on their other senses. And it's very interesting watching, the, I sometimes watch, um, the audience during, during a performance and how, how they react physically to the world around them. Um, a lot of people feel quite vulnerable, which is understandable. Um, but when they, they feel somebody going past, maybe they even hear them, but they feel them. And you can see people sort of... And that's just, that, that's a sense, I don't know how, what that sense is exactly, but you know, sometimes the singers move past and, and they're not making any noise. They're not singing and you, and you can't hear their feet. There are other times you can. Um, but, uh, and, and I've seen people shy away from somebody, wondering if there's somebody there. And I find that fascinating, that, that they're so attuned to the world around them quite precisely because they can't do it the easy way. That's interesting. I know, I know that for me, you know, when I went to the production, I didn't want to cheat. And I didn't cheat, but I have to say a couple of times, it was so hard for me to not see anything around me that I sort of raised the thing and looked at my feet and then put it back down again. Um, so I didn't, you know, cheat the production. That's well, maybe. <laughs> metaphor blindness. Our entire language, you know, we talk about our dependence on visual cues. Our language is constructed in such a way, you know, I have a, a, a very good friend who's blind from birth, and when I'd see him, he'd say, when I'd see him, he'd say, oh, I'll see you next week. He's not going to see me next week, but it's become so great in the language. Oh, I'm looking forward to that, whether it's a, a visual thing or not. And I've gotten into the habit as, as, a, as a music guy, if somebody says, oh, you need to hear my recording, I don't say, I'm looking forward to that. I say, I'm listening forward to that. Because of course I'm not looking forward to it. But I wonder, you know, are we trapped? I, my, my first question is, are we trapped by the senses, the limitation of one sense being dominant? But maybe above and beyond that, in terms of the acculturation, are we trapped by language, by vocabulary that is so sight dominant in the language itself? Uh, well, it's a hard point. It's hard to take that on, and I, I see the language problem twofold. There's there's that sort of I'll, I'll see you next week issue, but then there's also that is a little more neutral. Uh, but maybe it does feed into my other problem is the um, the, the negative metaphors that. That I was, oh, what are you blind? Um, you know, that, that somehow blindness is this uh, metaphor, or has been certainly through the ages, and we're getting better, but I think still it's, it's you're blind to something, you're not getting it. It's, a, it's more about knowing and what, or not knowing, or not being capable of understanding. And so, Equating that with the actual physical disability, I have a lot of problems with the, in the language. I think there is a difference between the kind of everyday or I'll see you, which is so casual that it doesn't, it's almost going to semantic to the left. But where one, I found very, in the last year when I've been really working on this a lot, I'm consciously trying to avoid um, use of seeing words, and seeing words when I mean understand. Because that's, I think, the moment when, when one talks about point of view or perspective, those are all about seeing, and actually, but I don't mean about what I can't see it. I see it, I mean my opinion on something. And we, we're very lazy in our use of language, well, we're very lazy in our use of language anyway, but, but I think in this particular instance, it, it does heighten that. Uh, perhaps because we are so dependent on vision as a society, that it becomes generally accepted that to see something is to understand it. Um, and by, by inference, therefore, not to be able to see it implies an inability to understand it. 
understand it, then clearly that's not true. And that said, for sighted people, uh, if I lost my sight tomorrow, I would struggle. I would struggle a great deal. That doesn't mean I could learn to have a very full and rich life. But it is true that I would struggle. I have no question I would find it. I wouldn't be able to do the job, for sure. Well, it's so interesting what you were saying about your vision changing, actually being a, a redistributed strength. But somehow, you're able to constantly experience the world in slightly different ways and have different perspectives on things in a way that perhaps is a greater understanding than the rest of us who kind of take it for granted. Well, I, I think that there's so much emphasis on uh, disability as, as lack and, and negative. And, and yes, if you lost your sight tomorrow, yes, of course it would be, it would be very difficult. But then there are, there's this other side to it where, um, you know, my experience is just my collected, you know, all the different experiences I have, which you know, some of which are challenges and some are, are assets. And in some ways, my, you know, when I try to read the newspaper, my my partial sight is a challenge. But when I'm, you know, doing other things, it's an asset. And it helps me to understand the world in a different way and to kind of question the truth of, of, of sight and what, what we see. So, um, you know, everyone has this kind of collection. I pick up on that a little bit because it's something that we talked about previously was um, because we, we we use sight generally to objectify, to define what something is, because we can do it pretty accurately. We're, as human beings, we're quite good at seeing, generally. Um, and I think that, that one, of the, one of the things that I've got heard back from the audience uh, during, during these performances is that not being, not seeing is actually free their imagination. Um, so rather than sitting there in a void of vision, they simply see it in their minds up. And they construct the whole forest and the island and whatever else is in the story. It's all there, and probably much better than anything I could have created for. I dare say it would have moved better than anything I could have afforded. Um, possibly technically possible. I'm sure we wouldn't have had the budget. Um, so it's a much, in some ways, a richer experience. It's like the reason why the film was never as good as the book. Ultimately, because much as I say. I wouldn't want to talk myself out of a career, but um, much as I say that it, with music, sometimes it's very helpful to have a visual element to help people engage with it. If you, if you rely on the visual element entirely, then you can never get lost in it. I think that's such a good point. And yeah, I think it would be fascinating to know a year from now to talk to people um, about their memories of their experience of the, the blind. Um, and, and to know what they say, you know, was it visual, was it um, olfactory, you know, is there, what, what stands out in their memory, quite different from seeing a visual performance of, of an opera. And I wonder if it would even be more, if it would even be still richer than, you know, your memory, um, if, you've, if you've developed that memory based on multi-sensory representations, you know, your memory is bound to be mm -hmm. enriched by that you know, down the line. But I think people were actually, have actually been, in a way, because the most of the audience have been sighted, um, the other is stimuli, um, you know, smelling something, feeling something, hearing a lot, have pushed their imaginations so that their visual sense of the piece has been heightened, almost, despite notionally taking it away. It's almost been greater. And in, in, the, in the question and answer sessions we've had, Almost the first thing that most people talk about is what they saw. Which I find is extraordinary. But, but I think it maybe relates to what you say about visual vision isn't, isn't the same all the time. That because you're, when you're having to kind of recreate and reconstruct, yes, right. and because people are effectively constructing a visual it's world for themselves, process. and it's active, instead of it just being, well, I open my eyes and I see that. Mm -hmm. it's, um, I'm looking through a kaleidoscope of some sort, and, they, and sometimes it's this, and sometimes it's that, and sometimes I can see more of this. And I mean, what an interesting world it would be if we, if we were all like that. I think, um, what is it that there, uh, the illusion of predictability that she mentioned in the program notes, that by blindfolding the audience takes away the illusion of predictability, which is something that I think sight often create or what we think of what we're seeing we think it, it creates a sort of false comfort and assumptions that we don't even realize we're popping in there that's why i say like 
you don't know how much actually goes into seeing, yes, there is a very objective, mechanical way that you're processing what comes in through your uh, eyes, uh, but so much more is going into that. And by removing or being open to those other senses, it, it, uh, it can heighten our experience. That's interesting. What about reading? That you, you read. Reading is something you do with your eyes, unless, of course, you've got an audio book going. You can experience it. But look at it through your ears or through your eyes. Or through your yeah, or exactly. Or through touch. So it is a multi sensory thing, it's sort of an abstraction. And through that, you then imagine things in your mind, and all your senses are active in that. You know, when I was a kid, I used to, love, I used to go on these long holidays with some, you know, seven hour car journey down to the south coast of England, it took forever. Um, but I remember I used to love having my story tapes, the set tapes. And I used to love them more than reading. And I wonder whether I loved them more than reading, because if I wasn't looking at the page, I was still freer to imagine what I was hearing. Well, in Shakespeare's uh, time, it was often said, I'm going to hear a play. Well, we still talk about an audience. Exactly. Well, so then for all of us who are involved as artists, either making art or bringing art forward to people, presenting art, curating art, you know, what can we do? The amazing thing about art, no matter whether it's art for your eyes, art for your ears, art for your senses, is it gets you to experience the world in a new way. It gets you to think about things in a new way. So knowing this about our sensory experiences, what more can we do with the arts to enrich people's lives more in a multi-sensory way? Maybe it's for you, Rebecca, first, but I think it's for all of you. Uh, well, I think we can uh, provide them, offer them experiences outside of the everyday that, that as, this, as, as this production of the mind is to, to experience things in you know, to, to kind of rebalance the senses, even temporarily, um, to experience and explore uh, things in a, in a new way. Um, for example, at the Met, one thing that, that I, I like to do in, in programs is have, have sighted people touch an object and draw it without looking. Uh, and you know, just, just kind of tweaking things a little bit to, to make people think differently and um, learn something about an object that they might not could not get through their eyes. So another example we have in our on our touch tour, uh, an ancient Egyptian sphinx of the female pharaoh Hatshepsut, and there's restoration which looks to the eye almost. You really have to know what you're looking for to see that it's restoration. But if you touch it, you can tell immediately that there's a warmer. The rest the restored areas are warmer than the granite, and the texture is different as well. So you can get this information about texture and temperature and sometimes weight, you know, that you can you can never get about an op a work of art usually, you know, if you're if you're by not buying the glass case by by looking. So so to me that, you know, I, I can offer people multi-sensory experiences that are very explicit. You know, you try this out, use your other sense, don't rely on your on your eyes. The Casso said painting is a blind man's profession. Um, he, he paints not what he sees but what he feels. And I think one of the one comment that I've had consistently over the, over the last few days, and actually previously as well, was that, that what we've done wasn't, wasn't so much like a piece of theatre or not, but something more like an art, an installation. And I find that fascinating, actually, because what you do is, is in a way, you kind of got this, what feels like a laboratory of, of possibilities for the senses. Um, there's absolutely no reason why a piece of theatre should be like that, too. But we kind of categorise that and say, well, that one is an art installation. But why, and then the theatre piece can't be. I mean, obviously, the blind is a piece of narrative, but it's a piece of theatre. It's a piece of, it's a drama that's played out in, in real life, it's active. It's a piece of theatre, it's not anything else. But yet, somehow, we want to box it into a little shape, into a corner, and say, that belongs like that. So, maybe what we, we need to be doing um, plays that aren't seen, or the plays that aren't heard, or um, a smell only. I know people have played with 
play with these ideas, but maybe we need to try and push that a little further so that um, so that we, instead of allowing ourselves to kind of pigeonhole everything, um, in the same way as you can, you know, genres are interesting when you push them towards each other and you fight and come up with something else, I think maybe even the senses are interested in that, interesting in that. Well, it was very, it was very interesting experience. We were talking amongst ourselves about this before. Four years ago, there was a production done at the Guggenheim called The Scent Opera. Is anybody in the audience at The Scent Opera when this was done? Show me one a couple of people. And it was the strangest thing. All of a sudden, you sat in these chairs and there were these microphones that went up to your nose and characters were various aromas. And you, you smelled them and there was music in the background, there was music that was background, the, the smell was, was foreground. And you weren't blindfolded, but there was really nothing to look at. And after it, I remember walking across Central Park and I almost hit into a tree because all of a sudden, all of these things that were normally ambient became foreground. And I was able to see and hear, but the smell which I normally relegated to this other thing, I was suddenly way more attuned to. Mm -hmm. Then I went to a restaurant later, all the food tasted wrong. Because I couldn't get certain aromas that were in that production. Related to your experience of like knowing Starbucks is around the corner before you can see it. But similarly, after experiencing wine, I had a very different experience of that. I was deprived of my sight for an hour, but then I, I went uptown. I was, all the senses were around me, and I went to that same restaurant, and everything tasted more heightened. I was, I was suddenly paying more attention to details, other details. I was smelling things, I was tasting things. It was sort of like an added value once I had my sight back. So I thought, well, there was this, set, there were a number of sort of dining in the dark, Things yes. around the world, which I guess is, I mean, you would expect it to, to taste more interesting and some more detailed in some way, simply because you were concentrating on not what people say, you know, it, it matters, the present, food presentation matters, but it shouldn't really. Right. You shouldn't eat your eyes. <laughs> anyway, we're, we're down to our, our last 10 minutes. I thought it might be good to get some questions from the audience here, and Jennifer's going to go around with a microphone, so. I would like you to talk into the microphone, say who you are, and, and stand so we can really get what you're saying, and hear it, and experience it in as many senses as possible, but as possible for you. So questions? Yeah, show sure, hands all the way up front. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Lowell Hill, and the two of us are going to see it tonight. Uh, any comments about uh, the fact that this is sung instead of being simply a play, does that add, change anything in people's lives? Well, it's a, one thing it changes completely is the fact that there's no orchestra. So we, we couldn't do it with the orchestra. The orchestra had to go somewhere. Um, so you couldn't experience um, a sung drama with an orchestra in this way very easily at all. It would be very difficult indeed. Um, the other thing is the fact that it's sung and there are 12 parts means that um, the sound doesn't come from one angle at a time. Um, if it was a play, it came from 12 angles at once, you wouldn't understand the thing. But one of the, the great things about opera is that you can do many things at the same time and you can still understand everything. That's, it's unique in that respect. And, and so the fact that the sun is, is, is certainly a very important element to have. Hi, I saw it last week, um, and I was wondering, what's been the biggest challenge about blindfolding the audience? Has there been a lot of pushback from the audience? Do they enjoy it? Or, I mean, obviously, there is an aspect of being uncomfortable. It's something that a lot of people aren't used to. But what's been the most surprising difficulty that's come with it? You know, the strangest thing, undoubtedly, for me, has been, I'm going to say something sexist now, it's men. Goodness me, what a fuss, a bunch of fuss pots. Um, <laughs> you should blindfold the man that he hates, he leaves, hates them to lose self-control. Um, he makes a fuss, he walks over something that's not what he thinks it is, and he stalls and makes a fuss, says, oh, what's that? He sits down, he's uncomfortable, he wants to know what's around him, and the women just get on with it. It's extraordinary, I feel quite ashamed. <laughs> so, so that's what I, the hardest thing has been the men, unquestionably. Guilty as charged. No, no. <laughs> it's very, really fascinating how 
And I dare say it's probably true about how, how the piece is received, that maybe um, the, because women seem to be the first people to speak about their experiences and to have a very more, a more vivid response to it than men. And I, I, I don't understand it, and maybe I'll need to do some more research, but I'm quite confused. <laughs> yeah, hi, my name is Charles. My name is Barry, and uh, first I'd like to just share that Helen Keller is, you know, the world I live in, the miracle work was based on, has been out of print for 67 years, it just came back. The most magnificent writing about touch, meaning and consciousness, you can download most of it for free on the internet, Helen Keller, the world I live in. The other thing that I'd like to ask you, I've been studying vision, visual education, visual literacy for a lifetime. That in a normal state of nature, when we move our eyes left, right, our brains evolve that way, so in a normal state of nature, a human being is actually capable of being aware of seven streams of awareness simultaneously. As we lock up our eyes on static letters, we don't move, we've caved in from seven to one. I was just wondering, in the work that you've done, especially with people with sight challenges, if you've ever been aware or kind of maybe stumbled into that seven point awareness that is in our nature but has never been used. Robert Altman, you know, used that. He was a bombardier in a plane, so he developed that. But uh, I'm just curious. Well, it is, it is certainly, um, it's difficult for anyone to, to, to attend to, to too much at once. So, kind of, I think that what we try to do is focus people's attention on different things at different times. I don't know if that really answers the question, but um, I think you have to, to kind of alternate your attention. Um, although combining senses, experiencing something where you are getting more than one sense at once is going to be different and is going to, you know, something's definitely happening there, but depending on what multiple senses are, are, are happening together or being experienced together, I think there are different effects. They can enhance one another or they can detract from each other. I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question to the guy, but it's it, so coming springing off that. Um, in the world of opera, we often cite Wagner as the kind of the god of, of understanding what opera could be, and he had this world of resemblance to it, which just means total art. Um, and it strikes to me that you can throw an awful lot of art at the stage and still only use two senses. Um, and that, so in terms of multiple, sensing multiple things at once, I am quite interested in, in to the extent which we have in this project explored senses simultaneously. Possibly we have heightened one more than another at a particular time. Um, but uh, it's almost like there's another word. I don't know what, what the right word would be. Um, but a kind of total sense work, if you like. Um, an artwork that, that tries to embrace all the senses. And that, that would be very curious. Um, I'm not sure how you do it. Like, I don't you, you know, you do fine Dutchmen and they have 15 huge wind machines in the Met. Um, <laughs> It'd be, it'd be exhilarating. Oh, thank you. I'm curious. The one word that nobody has brought up either in the questions so far, maybe, maybe somebody's itching to have that question, but nobody's here has brought up is the concept of synesthesia, the concept of how one sense could possibly impart on another sense. And I'm curious about where this goes, you know, now that you've done this production. Maybe. In future productions, maybe bringing vision back, but not losing these things that you brought with you. I have actually done a, a film project of um, sort of Scriabin's Black Mass, where I did try to create a, a graphic representation of every note. Didn't do it as accurately as I might have needed to to, to show it on television, but, um, but as it was an exercise as much as anything. Um, and that was absolutely fascinating, and it, it, sort of going back to the question of dependency on, on vision, there's no question that that audience who saw that found Scriabin's quite difficult music an awful lot easier when they could see patterns, when green kind of felt like it sounded like that, and the juxtaposition of green, green and purple. Because Scriabin had a sense that, if you like, every, every key on the, on the, on the piano you know, of, the, of, the, of the octave um, had a different colour. And so I basically put those colours on the screen when they were played. Um, and it did help. 
I mean, I certainly found it easy. It was really hard to do that. Now, you can only get aromas to come out of the TV and taste. That's quite scary. I mean, there's certainly <laughs> things like, we need to have a different remote control, and I don't want to smell that. <laughs> yeah, we, I think we have time for one more question. Up front? Oh, up front? Yeah. Oh. We'll give it to you. We'll give it to you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Nico Krell, and I'll be seeing it tonight. Um, keeping in mind that, that uh, sorry, I will be listening to it tonight. I'll be experiencing it tonight. Keeping in mind that on the spectrum of light, the vis visible light is only a fragment of that whole spectrum, and that there are other species of animals that access through their eyes a wider range on that spectrum. How do you think, knowing that the most able sighted human can only see so much, how does that interfere with our understanding of the world and understanding of art? Well, I mean, that's what we need. Um, wow. Well, if you get some nice chronos, you can maybe see high enough so many dogs can hear it. I think that it's difficult right, to conceive of art from beyond the human senses, but I'm, I'm not sure how we, what we do it for. There's a composer who wrote a piece for dog whistles, which you, you can't hear. It's, it's an element in the piece, and it's this supersonic thing. But that, that, that's dealing with beyond the, the range of hearing, but beyond the range of seeing. But it is interesting because it presumably there are things we can't smell, we can't hear, and every... Uh, okay, that's... you give me a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> that's the next production. No. <laughs> the, last, the, the last word. Yeah. Okay, so actually I have two questions. So the first question is much easier. And that is, uh, for this performance, you as the audience will be blind. So is this idea developed during when you're composing this piece or after you compose? So Lyra wrote the piece in, uh, when she was 21, basically, so a long time ago. She's a bit older than that now. Um, uh, but that's uh, quite a long time ago. And she wrote it in response to the play. She envisaged it to be staged normally with an audience here and the stage there, with the lights on, audience watching people, because that's the way the play would be done. Um, so that the two are not connected in any way. And then the second, second question I have is that this performance blind ourselves or cover our eyes. And so this basically removed our visual effects so to see anything. But and then we can concentrate on hearing. But to concentrate on hearing we can also say remove some I mean we can compare different situations. One is completely cover our eyes and one is we can open our eyes but there's nothing on the stage. We basically see nothing, only hearing. Or we can see and we can see the performance standing there, but doing no motions, they're just singing. How do you think this kind of, say, this three example might change the experience of hearing or understanding this piece? We do quite often have concert performances where, um, I mean, if you, if you had a, a lot of wind players on the stage, you wouldn't see a great deal of movement because, I mean, basically it's fingers, and a bit, but they don't do a great deal. I mean, string players do a bit more pins. Because it's so interesting to watch. Um, so I think that most concert forms is not terribly far away from, from what we were talking about. But you know, this uh, the material for this was a story uh, about blindness in one sense or another of the, the word. So there was no way that I was ever going to take away another sense. Um, it was, as I said earlier on, it was all about trying to make a connection with, between the story and this audience. If you did a piece about another sensory deprivation, then I guess you would do this too, you, you would take away that. And we'll be on stage talking about that one for <laughs> <laughs> few years in the future. I want to thank everybody and I want to thank the audience for coming out this afternoon and it was a very exciting discussion. I wish we could keep going and hopefully we will on our own email chain and hopefully we'll find a way to keep all of you engaged with this discussion. Hopefully this will get posted online at some point and we'll keep the discussion going. So Pamela, John, Rebecca, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.